And just as an FYI, you are muted. We don't see your cameras or anything like that. Um, okay, so just a little bit about who we are at Soccer Parenting and what we do. Um, my name is Sky. I am the founder of Soccer Parenting. Um, I am a formal, former professional player. I was an All-American in college, um, and I'm an active youth coach. I have my USSF B license. I'm a grassroots coach educator for US soccer. I also do um, some goalkeeper coach education for United soccer coaches, and I currently have a team. I have a U10 girls team. Um, I'm in Richmond, Virginia. Um, I started soccer parenting seven years ago. I have a couple of colleagues that I'm working with pretty closely now. Kelly and Elaine are doing a lot of work behind the scenes for soccer parenting. And, um, and Kelly manages our club relationships. So we have about 120 club partners across the United States. These are clubs that I collaborate with on parent education and engagement programming for their clubs. But in addition to that, um, they're, they're giving access to the Soccer Parent Resource Center, our education platform for parents and coaches. Uh, they're giving access to all the parents and coaches at their club, our club partners are. We also have some organizational partnerships with state associations um, across the United States. So we're working every day to make youth soccer better by providing education and information to parents. So I just wanted to kind of give you that greater um, overview. I know many of you follow us on soccerparenting.com, which is great. Thank you. And you're on our weekly mailing list to get our newsletters every week. If you're not, you can head over to soccerparenting.com and, and register for that. And then in addition to soccerparenting.com, we have a totally separate website called the soccerparentresourcecenter.com. And at soccerparentresourcecenter.com is our membership site where you can gain access to get all of the content that we have there for parents. I wanted to highlight before we get started here, our belief statements as these form the foundation of the work that we're doing. At Soccer Parenting, we really do believe that you soccer parents will be difference makers when it comes to improving the game. We believe that you soccer parents are sort of like the missing ticket that we haven't been focusing on. We've been ignoring. We haven't brought them in and brought you all into the youth soccer landscape that we have in the United States well enough. And when we do that, as we're working to do at Soccer Parenting and we're working to educate coaches and clubs on how to do that in terms of best practices, we really do believe it'll improve the game. We believe that when parents seek information about how to best support their player, that great things will happen. And you all are doing that today. So thank you for being here. You're really working hard, I can tell, um, to support your player and you're seeking information and guidance. And that's a great step. It's actually one of our largest challenges is really getting parents to engage with their content and see and understand that they actually have really clear things that they need to do in order to support their player. We also believe that a more collaborative relationship between coaches, parents, players, and clubs is in the best interest of player development. Um, so I work every day on establishing trust and talking about collaboration. We believe collaboration is a force multiplier in terms of improving the game. We definitely believe that collaborative relationships are in the best interest of player development. Mm -hmm. And finally, um, Oops, sorry about that. And finally, we believe that a strong and supportive community of level-headed and like-minded parents and coaches will inspire players. I'll get in just a little bit here to um, the work that we're doing in terms of just our every day um, in just a second. But what I wanna do is just kind of highlight what I wanna to accomplish today. So what I'm hoping to accomplish with you all in this next hour is to give you some motivation to really, really develop a deeper understanding. And I think the word understanding is really important here. Like this is um, things that you need to be curious about. I want you as soccer parents to be curious about how you can best support your child, how you can best support your player to make sure they're inspired by the game. I really want to help you appreciate the extremely important role that you play in your child's soccer experience. For so long, parents have been pushed aside um, and not been given the information, parents really, really have such a special influence on their child. So I want you to grow, to develop, to appreciate that, and to, again, build this knowledge and understanding about how you can best support them. We're gonna dive into five essential things that you all must understand as soccer parents. And then I really also wanna make sure that you all understand as parents that we are here to support you, to help you, to guide you, 
uh, to collaborate with you as well. Um, we uh, are in connect contact and in conversation with parents, obviously on a daily basis, trying to help them support their player. So the mission at Soccer Parenting is about inspiring players by empowering parents. And I get some pushback on this concept of empowering parents. I understand it's a confusing concept even for you as parents, but what the basic, that, the basic understanding I want you to have is that we want you to understand the power you have when it comes to your child being inspired by the game. I know that you're receiving a lot of mixed messages about engagement. Uh, some people are saying, be engaged. Other people are saying, don't go to practice. Don't be a crazy soccer parent. Care less, care more, collaborate with the coach. Give the coach space. You know, there's a lot of confusing and mixed messages in our soccer landscape. So I wanna be clear that we understand that. But at the end of the day, we believe that collaborative relationships between coaches, clubs, and players is in the best interest of player development. And parent engagement, we use this framework as coaches, clubs, and parents working together to ensure that players are inspired. And, you know, just a quick story, something that happened to me last year when I was coaching is that I had a parent reach out to me um, because their child had a question for me and they were nervous about coming to talk to me because they're a pretty shy child. And so just a parent working with me, feeling like it's a safe place to have to, to teach their child this lesson in coming to me as a coach with a question. Um, you know, that to me is a perfect example of coaches and parents working together to make sure that the children are inspired. This is what all the research, and there's lots of research about parent engagement. This is what the research says about parent engagement programs that are in schools, and I've kind of related this to what will happen in a club. So this is why it's really important for you all to be more engaged in your child soccer process and your child soccer experience. Um, uh, parents who are engaged, your clubs that have parents that are engaged will be a higher performing club, Maybe that has to do with wins. In my mind, that has to do with inspiring more players. Um, players will train on their own. Players will have higher aspirations and motivation. Fewer kids will quit playing, which is so important to the future health of our children. The coaches will be more satisfied and the parents will be empathetic. So that's, again, just a big snapshot. And this is some of the education that I bring to clubs and to coaches of why they need parent engagement programs but I also think on the flip side, it's important for you as parents to understand how important it is for you to be more engaged in the why and what the research says. Now, you might have a child that's kind of already inspired, or maybe you have a child that is going through a little glitch and isn't feeling super inspired. Really, uh, all parents have a role to play here. So if your child's already inspired, we really need to make sure that they're thriving that they're living up to their potential on the fields, that they're learning the life lessons that we intend for them to learn. As well as parents, if you have children that are inspired, you still really need to focus on parent education. So parent education is such an important component of parent engagement. And um, these are areas that you need to focus on for your education. You need to um, develop some deeper understanding about the nuances of the game, the laws of the game, offsides, uh, just real, finding a deeper connection to the game, that will help your child be more inspired. Um, get education regarding the next level, whether that's going from rec to travel, from travel to ODP or into the ECNL, or the girls, um, TA, the GDA or MLS Next, whatever it be, or playing college or professionally. You need information about the body, player, uh, like maybe injury prevention, growth spurts, strength, power training, all of those types of things. Obviously mental performance, the coach and club relationship, and then you need more information and education regarding parenting itself and how you can uh, you know, interact with your child in the most positive way. And then also obviously you need a strong community around you. And if you're a parent that has a child that's not inspired, we really wanna help you have confidence to follow your instincts as a parent. Usually children aren't inspired for three general reasons. Either the parents are putting too much pressure on them. We'll talk about that today. Um, the child's on the wrong pathway. We'll talk a little bit about that today, meaning they're um, not in an environment that suits their athletic potential and or their, uh, their athletic mentality towards sport. So maybe they're in a team that doesn't meet their needs or their learning environment isn't good enough. And we'll talk about that today as well. Um, parents also here need parent education and a strong community around them. 
Like I said, we're working every day to make youth soccer better. And we're doing that together. Coaches, clubs, parents. I know there's lots of coaches on this call as well. And I certainly welcome your questions as well. Really big picture, what we're doing is culture change. We're working to change the youth soccer landscape and the culture. And culture is a combination of knowledge, beliefs, values, behaviors, and that's something that we're really focusing on today. So today I'm diving in to five key areas that you need to build knowledge around. Um, I showed you our belief statements. I'd encourage you to go back to soccerparenting.com and check those out. Also at Soccer Parenting, we have the six soccer parent value statements, things like active health, coach integrity, life lessons, love of the game. So we have key um, parent soccer parent value statements. Um, those are available in Spanish language as well. And then obviously, you, if, once you build your knowledge, your beliefs, values, that really guides your behavior. So that's when we're seeing the culture change work. Okay, so let's get into these five things. So five essential things all parents must understand. I'm gonna pause just for a second. And uh, okay, just seeing some questions come in. That's great, just wanna make sure. So five essential things that all parents must understand. The first one here is a deeper understanding of motivation. This has become especially true during COVID when we've had all, all children in, um, inside and are given individual training programs by clubs. And some of the kids have been really keen on getting out and training for 20, 30, 40, an hour, minutes, whatever, a day. Um, others have not. <laughs> and so we have had to like triple down on the education we're doing with parents when it comes to having a deeper understanding of motivation. There's two key things that you need to understand here. The first is something I think a lot of parents are aware of, growth mindset. This is the research by Carol Dweck from Stanford University about growth mindset. Very simply put, and on the Soccer Parent Research Center, there's lots of content regarding growth mindset. Um, Carol, Dr. Dweck's book is called Mindset. It's very education related and related towards teaching and the classroom, but it's definitely relevant to parents. And very simply put, growth mindset is um, a child's confidence in, their, in, in the connection between the work that they're putting in and the improved outcomes. So um, you either have growth mindset or fixed mindset in situations or, you know, part of both. And this affects adults, kids, everyone. So in some situations, we have a very strong growth mindset, believe that the work we put in is going to result in better performance and higher outcomes. And other times we go in and we have more of a fixed mindset. We don't have the motivation. We don't have this positive mindset. We don't see the correlation. So it's like a common area we run into this is kids that are trying to learn to juggle. Some kids, you, you will give them a challenge and they will go and they'll work for 30 minutes every day until they can juggle the ball 50 times and they'll be so excited to do that. Like they will be excited to wake up and get out and try again. Other kids will be crying all the time. <laughs> they'll be like, no, I don't wanna do it, I can't do it. So that's growth mindset. And as parents, we actually can control and help our children develop um, more of a growth mindset. So we can help our children lean more towards a growth mindset, which is certainly a high performance mindset instead of a fixed mindset. And we do that by the words that we use with them and focusing on the process they're going through instead of the outcomes. So instead of saying, that's great, you scored a goal, you're talking about the effort they put in, their focus, their determination throughout the game, not so much focusing on the result to use the juggling a challenge idea. It's not how many did you get today? It's that's fantastic. You just went out there and spent 20 minutes. I'm so proud of that decision you made. So just generally, this is something that all parents really must have a deeper understanding about in terms of um, the motivation of their child growth mindset. The second area is self-determination theory. This is really groundbreaking research by DC and Ryan. Um, you can find this online. It's pretty common from a psychology standpoint, but this forms the theory of the science behind motivation. And in self-determination theory, there are three key components of motivation. For somebody to be in a highly motivated state, they need three things to be happening. The first is they need competence. So they need skill. They need um, confidence and competence in their ability to be able to perform. I think we over-focus on this in youth soccer in America. So we focus so much on like technical skill acquisition um, that, that we think that that's motivation. But what we really need to understand is that competence, 
your ability to perform a task is really only one part of, of motivation. Um, the next is autonomy. This is really come into play very heavily during COVID, I know. Um, so, you know, this has been a key thing that has been a problem uh, and that has been like an awakening for parents is our children are way over programmed and over scheduled. And when we say go outside for 30 minutes and play with a soccer ball, they have no idea what to do because they don't have strict guidance. And so helping our children develop autonomy is fantastic. And when I think about COVID and the results of COVID on our youth soccer ecosystem, I actually kind of get excited about this because this part of motivation is so important and has been so lacking. And, and I think that we're seeing a sort of a resurgence of kids finding their own personal connection to the game finding this sense of autonomy, that um, they want to do this because they have a strong connection to the game, that they're working on their own and motivated by themselves. Um, so autonomy is another super important thing about self-determination theory. And the third component of this, um, of this work on motivation is relatedness. We're going to talk about that in one of our future points, but it's how our children feel a connection to the game or maybe a connection to their teammates, a connection to the sport, a connection to their performance. So their relatedness and their connection to the task at the moment, how they're feeling about it. Um, and so from a parent's perspective, I think this is one of the key things that you all must understand is again, number one, building a deeper sense of awareness and understanding about motivation. So understanding growth mindset, really, really, really understanding self-determination theory. And like I said, there's a lot of great research, a lot of great TED Talks from both Dr. Dweck and from, um, and from Dr. DC that you will be able to find on, um, on YouTube. I love Dr. Dweck's uh, TED Talk called The Power of Yet. So with our children, instead of saying, you know, oh, you haven't learned that yet, and adding in the word yet gives them the sense of hope that there's potential that they will learn something, and that facilitates a growth mindset. So I encourage you to check out some different, um, you know, TED Talks related to both of these concepts of motivation. Number two is this understanding parents need a deeper understanding and knowledge regarding uh, athlete development. There's a lot of components to athlete development that we could get into here. I sort of narrow down and want to talk about a handful of them, but this is important to start with, is that this is the way we often imagine our children will go through their soccer experience, that they'll start as a rec player and they'll just kind of work their way up and they have this dream of a college scholarship, a pro contract, whatever that might be, and that they will just have this path of getting there. This is actually what the path really looks like, is this concept that development and athlete development is not a linear process. There are a lots of ups and downs and backward movements and uh, you know, to, as we're going along on this process. And most importantly, and what we really need to understand as parents when it comes to athlete development is that for the vast majority of our children, the vast majority of our children, this is what it'll look like. They will never get a scholarship to college, um, but their athlete development is really essential to their growing into a functioning adult that's healthy and has a healthy adulthood, and also has a deep connection to the game that they will carry with them for life. So maybe this will be the child that plays club soccer in college, or will become a coach or a referee, um, or a big fan of the game. Um, and find a deep connection to the game just from being a fan. So um, we need to really understand that development is non-linear. Um, the second thing that parents really need to understand about athlete development is just developing an understanding of the comparison trap. This is kind of related to what I was just talking about in terms of how um, development isn't linear. So our kids are developing, they go through these ups and these downs and all of these, you know, moments. Um, and, and I think this is really re relatable for people. And we especially see this, I especially see this, I feel like in the age where I'm coaching, this U10 age, because some kids have such a strong, so, so much um, stronger understanding of the game than others. Or also our kids are at such a key moments for learning that one game they'll be able to execute on a certain task and the next game they won't. And so we'll think they've learned something, but they haven't necessarily yet. Um, so there's lots of ups and downs. And what happens with a comparison trap as parents, we 
we see other children on the field that are keep going. And we see our children, our child take this little dip. And this key blue triangle is where things get really stressful. This is where we as parents start putting too much pressure on our children, where we talk to them too much after the game, where we give them long pregame talks about how they can you know, be exceptional at this game or what they're gonna do at practice, or we get too stressed. And whereas parents, we feel like our stress level is really rising, usually it's because this is happening and this blue space has formed. And most unfortunately, what often happens is that children drop out of the game at this point. So extremely important for us as parents to be aware of this sort of comparison trap also having this perspective on what real development looks like for our children so that we understand eventually where they're going to get. Likely not up to the college scholarship space, but just across developing a love of the game that they'll have for life, and we need to let them have their own journey through the game. I really think this is important, is that we need to, as parents, focus on just developing this love of the game. Like I just said, just this connection and helping our children develop the connection to sport and to their teammates and learning all these great life lessons. Because that's really what we're, what this experience and this youth sporting experience will be all about. Another really key important thing from an athlete development standpoint for you all to understand as parents is relative age effect. This is a very big topic. In fact, yesterday I was on a call with um, somebody Bob from the Belgian FA. I was happily invited onto the call um, that was with a lot of the MLS Next coaches and really great presentation that um, he did from the Belgian FA. I think he's the U17 coach or U17 coach right now and does a lot of work with the Federation. But we talked a lot about relative age effect. And just to make this very simple, because it's actually really important for parents to understand as well, is that relative age effect is the phenomenon that the majority of children that are chosen to elite level sport are from earlier in the birth cutoff. Our birth cutoff now in the United States is a birth year, so it would be January. And so when we're going through this, when we're going through a selection process, unfortunately, what happens is that the majority of players that are chosen are from that earlier part of the birth year. There's understanding on that. They're they're eight months um, older, just from a month standpoint. But you know that can be even longer from a development standpoint. This is some interesting data that I think you all would be interested in. So this is the U17 European Championships back in 2019 for the boys. So these are all the boys that were on the various teams that were competing in the U17 European Championships. 57 of them were born in January. And this will just give you a really good visual of what we're talking about when it comes to relative age effect. Um, and I think this is essential information for parents to understand. So if you have a child that's towards the end of the birth year, you really need to be cognizant of the comparison trap. You really need to be seeking um, different, potentially different experiences for your child to make sure that they have the support that they need. And you really need to be okay, potentially, with them not being on the top team um, and finding their path and developing within the second team. Uh, the really good research that we got into yesterday, which I really enjoyed, was the long-term effect, is that the catch-up that happens and that we actually see the younger kids in the birth year um, competing more in the future at high levels. And that's because of the mentality that they've had to develop, the awareness they've developed as smaller players, the different skills that they've had to develop in order to succeed. So there is hope for all of us with, parent, with kids. My daughter's a November birthday at the end of the birth year. Um, but it's just something that we as parents need to be very cognizant of. Another thing from, elite, from athlete development that we need to be aware of is that functional movement is now, as parents, our responsibility. Helping our children develop functional movement skills falls on us because they're not getting it in PE classes anymore, and they don't have these interactions outdoors with friends. They're not playing in trees and jumping all around and having this time outside and this free play experience where they're developing their sense of their body and proprioception, their body moving in space. And, um, and so as an example, I asked um, the girls on my U10 team, again, to go back to that. Um, four of them didn't know how to do a cartwheel, had never been taught, and five of them didn't know how to do a forward roll. 
So these are essential movement skills that we have with kids. And now as parents, we just need to take responsibility for this falling onto our plate. Um, whether or not if we choose to get our kids involved in Taekwondo or different dance or different movement, gymnastics to help develop these skills is you know, something to consider. But really we need to see, uh, realize that this does become our responsibility. Kids that can move better will perform better, have more confidence, have more of a connection to the game, and will have less injuries as well. And we have some really good conversation about that on the Soccer Parent Resource Center with experts in the space. Um, if you go into the library there and you search um, long-term athlete development or athlete development, you'll find some really good content and interviews about this. Number three. Parents need to understand the important role that you play in establishing a sense of community. This work that I do on sense of community with clubs and coaches and encouraging them to establish this is really, really important. It's fantastic research. Sense of community theory was um, originally done by Macmillan and Chavez in 1986. There's been follow-up studies by Warner and Dixon and um, Eric Legg, who I have collaborated with, he works at Arizona, Arizona State now, he did a fantastic study that actually took sense of community theory and what, uh, and this is uh, what components need to be in place within a group for us to be, feel a strong connection to it. And Eric and his study related this to sports parents and then extrapolated this data to say, this is what sports parents need. Um, this is an hour long presentation I would normally do with clubs, um, but I'm going to get into this research very quickly with you on a very broad top level um, space and, and way just so that you understand this because it's so important for parents to understand in today's day and age where we're so busy, where our kids are often jumping from team to team every year. It's not like how it was for me when I grew up. I played pretty much on the same team until my junior year in high school. Um, you know, that's different now, so the parents don't have these deeper relationships. Really, really important for parents to understand. There's four dimensions of community. The first is group membership. And within group membership, there's four components. So again, in this next slide, we're talking about the four components of group membership. So we all relate to this. Um, we do, I think, have a pretty okay sense of what group membership means. We have a personal investment. We pay, usually, for our children to play sport. Um, and this is, these are slides that I work a lot with coaches and clubs on, is that we need boundaries. In order for us to feel a strong connection to the group, as parents, we need boundaries. So I work with coaches on that. Like this is what you need to open the door to parents to engage with you about. This is what's not okay for conversation. Parents shouldn't be talking to coaches about um, specific like substitutions or tactical decisions they made in the game, but should be talking to the parent if they have any questions about their player's inspiration or want to learn more about the game, those types of things. So we need boundaries to have group membership. We also need emotional safety. The example I used earlier of the parent that called me with their child who had a question for me and their very shy child, that parent felt emotionally safe with me that they could call me, that I wouldn't like ding their child as the coach because their child was shy or they were nervous. I wouldn't think less of the child. Instead, we thought this was a great opportunity for the child to learn. So that's emotional safety. We also need to have a sense of belonging, like a connection to that group. Maybe that's with the gear that you wear that's related to the club or the team, things like that. So the second dimension of community, we just went over group membership, is needs fulfillment. And as parents, I think it's easiest to say that we need our children, uh, we, we need to feel confident that the coach cares more about our child as a person than they do as a player. That's what I need. I need for my child's coaches to know that they care about them as a person, that they're treating them well. Um, another dimension, important dimension of community for us to think about as parents is influence. We'll get into this when we talk about sideline behavior a little bit later, but influence is bi-directional. The coaches have lots of influence on the community, as do the parents have lots of influence in the community and the, and the coach. And what I always find interesting when I'm talking to coaches is that by and large, they will say that it's the parents that have all the influence. 
the coaches will say the parents can make my life miserable, that a crazy soccer parent has ruined it for me, that they can complain, they can take a lot of my energy with too many questions. Um, and then when I talk to the parents, they say, oh, it's the coach that has all the influence. They're the one that can make my child's life miserable. They're the one that controls my child's playing time if they're gonna make the team or not. They're the one that generally controls how my child will feel when they get in the car after a training session or a match. So um, we need to understand that influence is important, but I also want you as parents to understand the important role that you do have when it comes to influence within the greater soccer community, whether that's your club or just a team. And then finally, and this is what I think is really, really important for you as parents to understand is a shared emotional connection, is that we will have a stronger sense of community, which by the way, is important from a let our children stay involved in sport and developing healthy habits for life um, for them staying and being inspired by the game is the sense of community is essential to that. Um, but shared emotional connection is important. I think parents play a key role here. I have been, and I wrote about my team recently. Um, if you go to the resource center to soccerparity.com, you can see a blog article about um, when a losing season is a win. And I wrote about my parents and this great emotional connection that they developed because they were intentional. And on my team, I have uh, team managers and I also have social coordinator. So the social coordinator is responsible for doing just that, coordinating social activities for the players and for the parents, making sure that um, you know, if we were able to go to away tournaments that we have team meals set up and games set up and different ways to interact, maybe even sightseeing, just different ways that we can develop the shared emotional connection. So um, really, really important. And I, like I said, I know that we're busy. We have multiple kids that are all playing in different directions and often we're in and out and we're often told not to be too involved and we don't want to be a crazy parent, but we also need to understand that a shared emotional connection and doing our work, doing our part to make sure that we know all the names of the parents on the team, that we're building those connections is super important. So again, all parents play an essential role when it comes to establishing the sense of community. Number four on our topics here is actual learning about sideline behavior. And I was really intentional with the words that I use here to say actual learning, because we do a lot with sideline behavior, but it's not really uh, a great intervention that changes behavior. Sideline behavior is not getting better. Um, and it isn't getting better because we haven't necessarily been using the proper interventions, meaning we're not really teaching you as parents and we're not teaching coaches and clubs what sideline behavior is all about and what the effects are on children. So let's dive into that a little bit here. Um, so this is not giving a parent a lollipop saying be quiet. I mean that kind of is an okay intervention. This is not saying it's a silent Saturday, you can't talk. That's an okay intervention. But again, these things aren't working. At the Soccer Parent Resource Center, and again, you'll have a three-day pass to it, you can go in and you can watch the Sideline Project, which is a 13-minute video that I've created that is an intervention that's working. Clubs that are using this are saying that their sideline behavior is totally changing, their culture is totally changing. Coaches that are requiring all the parents or the team watch it are seeing a definite difference. So um, we need to actually learn about sideline behavior. There's three types of sideline behavior that we work with at soccer parenting. We've sort of de uh, developed this framework. There's supportive communication. We all pretty much know what supportive communication is. This is um, our communication to a child during the game. It might be good job or keep going or go team, you know, just sort of benign communication that's outside any specifics and it's just supportive communication. The second type of communication, and again, uh, is, is hostile communication. There's limited research on uh, communication, on sideline communication, but there has been some limited research done by Omni et al. And what we find is that hostile communication makes up 30% of sideline communication. And it's important for us as parents to understand how prevalent hostile communication is. This is talking in a derogatory manner to the referee, to your child during the game, to another child, absolutely not acceptable. Um, and what we need to understand is that the level-headed parents need to take the sidelines back. We need to take the sidelines back from the crazy parents who are often 
um, repeatedly hostile communication offenders and let them know that that behavior is no longer allowed and not tolerated. And we need to take our sidelines back and the level-headed parents need to have some power here. And the reason that we need to is because of the effect that hostile communication is having on our children, is having on the referees and the massive shortage of referees that we have in our country. So um, hostile communication is one of the components that really just needs to go away. Usually parents are pretty clear. Yes, supportive, yes, hostile, I get that. But where the confusion comes in is with this third one. And this is distracting communication. So distracting communication is communicating to your child in the middle of the performance. If you are telling your child what to do, you are distracting. It seems like you're helping them in the moment. So maybe if your child needs to, um, you know, you say, shoot, and then they shoot and you think, oh, well, I told them to shoot. And so they heard me. And so they did that. And that worked. Um, it's not working. It's distracting your child. And while it may be helping in the moment from, um, from in the moment for that task at hand, it's not helping them when it comes to long-term skill acquisition. And there's plenty of research about that that you can find on the Sideline Project video um, and attachments that I have and downloads that I have at the Sideline Project video. Um, but distracting communication needs to totally end as well. And when the level-headed parents decide that they're gonna stop the distracting communication, which by the way, is usually only because we're stressed on the sidelines, we're feeling stress and anxiety during our child's game. So we start distracting communication. I do this as a coach this year. I did it way too much. My team was in a league that they were struggling with. And I found myself reflecting after game saying, I talked way too much during that game. And I'm not helping my kids develop. I'm just distracting them from learning the task at hand. So really important that as parents, we understand and as coaches, we understand supportive, hostile and distracting communication. The other thing I encourage all of you to do is to have a conversation with your child. Do you want to hear my voice during the game? Do you even want to hear me say, good job? And when I ask my daughter if she wants to hear my voice, she says, no. She said, mom, just hearing your voice is a distraction. Even if you're telling Hannah or the goalkeeper from her club team that she did a great job and goal, had a great save. Um, or if you're talking to me, I just don't like hearing your voice. It gets me sidetracked. So at Callie's games, I just sit in attentive silence. I'm paying attention. I'm watching. I'm engaging with her, but I am not talking because that's what she wants. And it's her game. My son, on the other hand, likes to hear my voice when it's supportive communication, it gets him going, it motivates him. So we need to add, talk to our children about what they want from sideline behavior. But most importantly, I want parents to understand that we can't just keep allowing hostile negative behaviors to be happening. We need to take our sidelines back and I give you some key ways to do that in the sideline project video. And finally, a fifth, um, a, the fifth thing that all parents must know is we need to have a stronger understanding of what a quality learning environment looks like. So this is key. And this is a lot of information. I have dove into what some of the key components are from, for parents to, to grasp. And there's so much debate about what real learning looks like. But some of it is very clear, and these points are very clear. It's not that there's debate, there's just confusion. When we as parents dive into what the research says about quality learning environment, it is very, very clear. So to begin with, as parents, we need to understand that soccer is a very unique sport. This is not American football, where there's plays that specifically happen. This is not basketball where the point guard you know says we're running this play number two when they're dribbling the ball up the court soccer is a very unique sport in terms of how it's played in terms of the tactics the decisions that are happening on the field and i have to say that quite frankly a lot of times we have it all wrong we're um we're not executing on the right things when it comes to our understanding of what real soccer is it's not necessarily about the task at hand as much as it is about the decisions and the player's awareness of things. So as parents, just very generally, we need to understand that soccer is a unique sport. It's not like any other sport in America when it comes to what a proper learning environment looks like. So kids standing in cones, dribbling back and forth, 
dribbling through cones during a training session is likely not the best way for them to acquire skill. And again, there's lots of research about that. Skill acquisition is a process. So going back to that like up and down and twisting line, that could relate to skill acquisition as well. And how our children interact with the game and interact with the ball and their ability to acquire skill is a process. Um, there is a lot of research about specific skill acquisition and a ton of debate in youth soccer right now about should we be teaching individual technical stuff to kids? And there's a big movement now that I'm happy to see where we're taking that individual skill acquisition, individual technical training, and we're taking it out of practice, encouraging kids to develop autonomy and do that on their own, similar to how we used to play pickup. Now kids could do those programming. But during the practice sessions, we really need to be focusing on um, our connections, our decision-making, our awareness of space, and we need to be interacting with people in a game-like manner in order to develop the skills the fastest. And again, there's a lots of research about that as well. Environment matters. What I say to parents is that as parents, you know, what's so important and what your number one decisions are is that you're choosing the right environment for your child and one that supports their athletic potential and their athletic mentality, as well as your family goals and abilities and needs in terms of travel and time and finances. Um, but environment really does matter. Who the coach is matters. What the coach's understanding of the game really does matter. And how our children interact during a session matters. I say this because I hear from a lot of coaches that say, oh, I want to do more playing and games-based learning for the children, but the parents are putting pressure on me because they say it doesn't look like soccer practice if there are cones everywhere and the kids aren't doing it, skills and stuff like that. So we need to just develop our understanding of what environment needs to look like. And we also need to understand as parents when it comes to learning is that performance is a very unreliable indicator on if learning is happening. So performance meaning game results, those types of things is a very unreliable indicator, especially because some of our children, like we said, are ups and downs and are maybe not as strong or as tall or as fast as other players, but they might be, um, going through lots and lots of learning, but it might not show in the field if they're competing against players that are maybe taller or bigger than them. So a lot of key things for us to understand when we talk about performance, but we can't gauge whether or not learning is happening based on performance. Um, maybe we have a coach that is like micromanaging all the players, telling them what to do all the time, and the team keeps winning because the coach is telling them exactly what to do all the time. That's not learning. That team is learning to listen to the coach telling them what to do. They're not necessarily learning about, um, about the game itself. Practice design is important. I kind of got into this a moment ago when I was saying that coaches, I hear feedback from them. If I create a good practice that's very um, player-centered, uh, that parents, I'm getting feedback from parents that it doesn't look like a good quality practice because there's not enough skill acquisition in terms of what we're used to with dribbling and stuff. So practice design is important. Holistic practice design, if you can imagine that squiggly line for how development isn't linear, and then as a coach, imagine a coach trying to develop a practice that speaks to each individual player and where they are in their journey, that's good quality practice design. An example I like to use with parents as well in this situation is this concept of how we have players interact during um, during practice or games. So an example I could use during a game is a question as a coach I could ask. So I could, as a coach, I could tell and scream out to the players on my team, get goal side. And I could tell the kids on my team, let's say it's a corner kick for the other team to get goal side. Or I could scream out, how can you protect the goal? and I can help the players make their own decisions. So if we can design practices that are causing the players to think and process like that and make decisions, that's when the real, real learning is happening. You know, learning looks like having fun. Your child should be inspired. So when your child is inspired, um, they will be more apt to learn. So when they have more of a connection and joy around the game, so it is important that we understand that. And this is where I go into encourage parents to really follow your instincts about how your child is 
feeling. Um, there's a lot of reasons, like we talked about earlier, why kids might not feel inspired. Maybe they are, um, there's too much pressure from the parent. They're not in the right environment. The coach is, is um, being mean or more of a bully type coach. There's a lot of reasons, or maybe they have an issue with the players, or maybe they're, like I said, just not on the right pathway and they need to be in a lower or a higher playing environment. But having fun should be foundational to it. However, Struggling should work too. So not everything's going to be fun, you know, like not making a team and having to go through those lessons is not fun, but it's some struggle that will eventually relate to some learning that will happen down the road. So just please keep in mind that up and down journey that our children take. And a lot of times those down journeys are struggling moments or when they don't quite get something yet. They can't quite figure it out. Their brain and their awareness hasn't really caught up to be able to execute and make the decision yet. But the key word there is yet. Um, but the struggle is where the learning will happen. And so as parents, we need to make sure that we're not trying to come in and fix things and make things okay. The struggle is actually very, very important to learning. And finally, learning looks like our children developing connections to the game. And there's key things that we could do as parents here. And I call these like finding moments of inspiration for your child to feel a deeper connection to the game. Moments of ignition is what I say. So like where we're gonna ignite this fire in them and whether or not that's having the TV on around the house so they can watch the games, helping them encourage them to find a team to follow or a favorite player or get them a jersey for Christmas, uh, you know, just helping our children develop a deeper connection to the game and little ways that we can ignite this connection for them is really, really important because that's where learning happens too. We talked about that with motivation and relatedness is one of the key things about motivation. So if our children are feeling that connection to the game, uh, maybe it's even developing bigger connections and better connections with their teammates inviting i know we can't really with COVID now but you know establishing deeper friendships within the team itself and that's something that as parents we can really really facilitate you know the quality of a community and its culture is really reflected in the standards that we set for ourselves and so this is a slide i go through with coaches all the time like what standards are you creating for your community um, what are your coaching standards? And I ask parents this as well. You know, I hope that at the end of the day, as you're listening to this, that you will have increased standards for yourself on what it means to be a soccer parent. It's, it's much more than um, a lot of times we're letting it be. And there's more ways that we do need to engage and connect with the game. And again, I would just encourage all of you to kind of just set down, you know, what are my standards in terms of what do I believe to be true about what my role is as a soccer parent to make sure that my child is inspired. As we're wrapping up here, I want to make sure that you know that we are here to help. Um, on social media, we're interacting with people all the time. You can follow us on at Soccer Parenting on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. Twitter is probably where I'm most active in terms of connecting and messaging people and responding to people. Um, and we have club partnerships all over the United States. So we have about 120 club partnerships. We're definitely growing that. And then there's a you know, community that we're building through the Soccer Parent Resource Center as well. Uh, it's impossible for me to show you the Soccer Parent Resource Center and give you a feel for it. So I put this slide together to maybe overwhelm you for a second. I mean, this is just maybe a quarter, if that, of the content that we have on the Soccer Parent Resource Center. So there's these concepts of soccer talk or breaking out the game. There's an Ask the Expert section where I have a phenomenal group of coaches that parents are asking questions and the experts are answering them. We do interviews every month. You can catch all the recordings of the interviews. There's articles, courses, Soccer Parenting 101, 201, 301, the Sideline Project, tons of information on the Soccer Parent Resource Center. And you do have a three-day three, three day pass. So if you go to soccerparenting.com slash join, You'll find a three day pass if you're not a member already to be able to get behind the membership wall and take a look at all of the content that's there. So I certainly encourage all of you to check that out. And I'm going to look now um, into questions and discussion um, through here. So I encourage you all to pop in any questions. Um, yes. Yes, I know the soccer parenting side, the soccer, the sideline project work that we're doing and improving the sidelines is essential. Somebody's asking for what those three were. So it's supportive, 
distracting and hostile communication. And key things are is that we need to eliminate distracting communication. Obviously, we know we need to eliminate hostile communication. Clubs need to step in with stronger policies there. Um, but as parents, we need to be much more cognizant of our distracting communication. Because when we think we're helping, we're actually not facilitating learning for our children. Um, all right, lots of positive comments here. I appreciate it. Um, yeah. How do you get your children to get away from the video games and practice more? I wish I knew. Um, no, I think that um, developing connections, and this is where coaches can come in too, um, in terms of setting some standards for the team and being aware of like, this is a challenge for me. And I would encourage you to talk to the coach like this, I'm trying to get my kids off video games. What can we do to create some challenges for them so that we can build that for them? Um, also, parenting is hard. I mean, sometimes we have to just shut it down and just say none today, no gaming today and see what happens. And then our children will find these deeper connections. I'll also say though, randomly that my kids know so much about international football because of playing FIFA and teams and structures. And my son, you know, understands a lot of tactics just from playing. So there, there's some connection that it can build. And I think we're in like a new level of this age of parenting with children in the video games. I don't see a ton of questions here. I appreciate all of your comments. Um, you know, lots of um, good comments there. Here's one from from Jamie. How do you help kill, kids build a connection with their teammates and coaches if kids are moving around to different teams and a new season starts? I, I hear you loud and clear. And this is why parents need to be super intentional. And this is exactly why I, as a coach, create this parent social coordinator role. Um, I think my team to this year maybe is half and half, maybe six, I have 10 girls, six and four. There's at least four new girls on the team, I think five. Um, and we've done a great job because we've been really intentional about it. Our, our social coordinator has jumped in with lots of great activities. Um, every time there's a birthday, we're celebrating it. Even via Zoom calls that the kids have connected, I just had um, the parents on the team reach out um, on Team Snap yesterday. A parent said, "Hey, let's do a holiday gift, online holiday gift exchange, or online, or I think it was online." Um, and so, you know, parents are being super proactive with it. Um, you know, we have to we have to work hard to build these connections. And I agree, this isn't ideal that everyone's moving around all the time, but it is just how it is. Oh, lots of other questions here. What we can, what can we do to overcome the challenge of having a kid born in December then? Hey, I hear you loud and clear. I mean, my daughter was originally at the beginning of the birth year and then when it changed, she went to the very end and kind of missed her junior year, was all of a sudden playing with seniors who had all committed. So I felt a lot with birth year specifically. I don't know if you even remember when that changed, but um, you know, we have to understand that kids with a December birthday, there's a lot of potential for them. They are the potentialers that are out there is how I think we can refer to them. I think it's important that you let your coach know, like if you uh, do see them struggling, because it's not just the, um, the actual birth year. Yes, they might be eight months behind or 10 months behind a lot of their teammates, but also growth wise, they, they you know, once we look into like growth, it can even, the span can be much larger. It can be like a 15 or a 16 month gap. So advocating for your child, making sure they're having other opportunities to play, encouraging them if they're on the second team and there's a third team, talking to them about getting down to that third team and playing as much as possible. If they ever need a guest player or can go to an extra practice there so that your child can build some confidence around the ball. And so sometimes they need to be in environments where they're not too stressed from a physical standpoint. So we certainly can do that, but it's just a matter. I mean, that's a perfect example of clubs, parents and coaches collaborating. Um, with clubs training year round, how do we get our children the appropriate rest they need to avoid burnout? Really great questions. Lots of good content about that on the Soccer Parent Resource Center. I encourage you to check out some of the conversations I've had with Dan Abrahams, with Stuart Singer, uh, about these types of topics who are both smart psychologists. Um, I also think that if kids have a strong connection to the game, that they're not going to get burned out. So I don't know how often your child is playing and if it's like on three different teams and every day they're training or whatever. But for the most part, kids that are on a team, even if it's year round, hopefully they're getting a good month off and then a month or two in the summer and having a little bit of a break where they can interact differently. 
But if they are experiencing burnout, I also would question their level of inspiration and how we can help and support them there. Um, I think that's good for questions here. If there are any others, I will look forward to getting back to you all answering some um, on social channels. So if you pop onto Twitter, if there's a question here that I don't see right now, I will go ahead and get to that on Twitter so you can go back and check the Twitter channel. Um, I really, really um, appreciate everyone being here today. Um, just a little bit quick um, information. Um, you know, I, I, like I said, I super appreciate you being here today and taking this step. Um, my biggest challenge is the work that I'm doing with soccer parenting is making sure that parents are actually engaged and seeing the important role that they play and collaborating with coaches and working in coach education to make sure that coaches and clubs are providing a path for parents at their club as well. So thank you all so much for being here to get today. Again, you can check out the Resource Center and the hundreds of articles and content we have there by going to soccerparenting.com slash join um, and you can register for a three-day pass there. So again, thank you so much. I look forward to connecting with all of you all on social media. Thanks.